Well, hello and happy new year to everyone. Welcome to kickoff of season two of the Healthy Skeptic MD podcast. I'm Dr. Michael Hoffman. Hope everybody had a nice time off for the holiday. In this season two of the Healthy Skeptic MD, we are going to take on key common medical decisions that all of us need to think about. Questions such as, should I take a daily aspirin? Should I get screened for prostate cancer? What about a daily multivitamin or a glass of red wine to protect my heart? Today, our focus is going to be on the common medical question of, should I take a daily uh, cholesterol medication? Our guest is Dr. Rita Redberg. She's a cardiologist at the University of California, San Francisco, and she is the editor-in-chief of the prestigious JAMA Internal Medicine, one of the top medical journals in the country. To frame our discussion today, we are going to focus on statin medications for cholesterol. This is the class of medications like Lipitor, Zocor, Crestor, the generic names being Atorvastatin, Simvastatin, Rasuvastatin. These are some of the most commonly prescribed medications in the world, and they are recommended for people with a history of heart attacks or strokes, those with diabetes, those with very high cholesterol levels. But the controversy comes because there's been more and more interest in using them for people at high risk for heart disease, but don't, who don't actually have a history of it. And the latest guidelines do recommend considering uh, statin medications and for, for those at high risk. And our guest today, Dr. Redberg, is going to make the case that these guidelines may be a bit of an overstep and the most effective thing that we can do uh, for those at risk of heart disease is focusing on the simple things, the lifestyle changes, diet, exercise, and so forth. And I uh, tend to agree with her uh, on this. So it's a really good discussion. Please stick around for it. Um, if you do find today's discussion interesting and helps you get engaged in your health, please do search and subscribe to the Healthy Skeptic MD podcast, wherever it is you listen to podcasts, or search for the Healthy Skeptic MD on YouTube. And please do share the link with family, friends, and others who may be interested. Okay, so before we jump into our interview with Dr. Redberg, as always, let's do a quick rundown of the health news of the week. So the first item I want to touch on, we're starting to learn more. We got our first official report from the CDC on those severe anaphylaxis allergic type reactions to the COVID-19 vaccine. According to the CDC report, the occurrence of these is about one in 100,000 people which is a small number, of course, um, but it is higher than what we've seen with the standard flu vaccine. In fact, it's almost 10 times the rate. So it's absolutely something we need to take seriously and think uh, carefully about how to reduce this. Um, the first lesson here is that it is important to stick around after you've gotten that vaccine for a good 15 minutes. 75% of these reactions occur within the first 15 minutes after vaccination and with appropriate medical care, namely an EpiPen. Uh, the vast majority of these can be very well uh, managed. Um, secondly, the vast majority of these reactions occur among those with history of severe anaphylaxis allergic type reactions, the type of people who have severe bee allergies or food allergies and carry around an EpiPen. So if you fall into this category, you should definitely reach out to your medical provider and talk about whether there's a way you could be monitored for longer or more rigorously after receiving uh, the vaccine. So nothing to be alarmed about that should interfere with you getting the vaccine, but something we do need to think carefully about, um, particularly if you have a history of uh, anaphylaxis reactions. The second item I want to talk about is how do we get this uh, COVID-19 vaccine distributed faster? Right now, we're only at about 1% of the population. There was a very interesting and provocative article in the Washington Post by two prominent public health experts this week, Dr. Bob Wachter and uh, Ashish Jha. They suggested uh, somewhat controversially that uh, we really focus our vaccination efforts on getting the first dose of the vaccine out to as many people as possible, and then subsequently come back and give the second dose uh, to people. Now, the CDC came out against this, as did many other public health experts, highlighting that the vaccine has been studied as a two-dose series, and we should stick with what the evidence uh, shows. But I think um, it's good that the idea was out there, and if we continue to be really slow getting the vaccine out there, uh, this may be an idea that we do uh, come back to. So for now, stick with the two-dose series, but let's Keep in the back of our minds the possibility of this um, one-shot sequence as we learn more and we see how quickly we can get the vaccine out there. The third item I want to mention, uh, we got, there was a paper in uh, JAM, one of the JAMA Network journals that estimated that 14% of Americans so far uh, have been infected with COVID-19. So we're starting to see a significant number of the pop proportion of the population be infected, but we're still a good ways away from that uh, 70 
plus percent threshold that we're going to need for herd immunity, which of course is why uh, the vaccine is so important. Finally, I want to mention one non-COVID-19 study. Uh, it was a comparison of patients on the public Medicaid program with those on commercial private insurance. The study found that Medicaid patients are significantly more likely to get their care uh, in emergency departments and less likely in private uh, doctor's offices, primary care offices. Now, one of the uh, the key goals of Medicaid, of course, is to get people uh, preventive care, preemptive care, and prevent those downstream complications that lead to expensive uh, and, and bad emergency room visits. So the message here for policymakers is we need to make the Medicaid program more accessible. These networks are very narrow. It's hard for patients to get Medicaid appointments. And if we want to achieve that goal of the Medicaid program of being preemptive, um, we do need to Think about how do we make Medicaid more accessible and easy to use for patients. So that's it for the news summary for the week. Let's jump into our interview with Dr. Rita Redberg. Well, welcome to the Healthy Skeptic, uh, Dr. Rita Redberg. Thanks for having me, Dr. Michael Hockman. Well, you are a uh, cardiologist at the prestigious UCSF School of Medicine. Um, could you just begin by telling us a little bit about your practice and what patients you care for? Sure. So I see a general cardiology practice. It's also could be called preventive cardiology. So I see all comers, patients that have known heart disease or people that want to prevent heart disease. I see, you know, people with congenital heart disease, although not a lot because we have specialty practices for that. Mostly heart disease, uh, palpitations, arrhythmias. And I do see a lot of people who want to stop taking medications, particularly statins, because I have written in that area. Well, in addition to being a clinician, you've done a lot of research throughout your career. And, you know, again, we're going to focus today on statins. But just big picture, what are some of the, the most prominent research findings you found uh, during your career? So you know, I've been at UCSF over 30 years now. And when I started, I did a lot of work on heart disease in women and whether there were uh, different risks and benefits for um, all kinds of treatments for heart disease in women. And then I started getting a little more oriented towards health policy and actually did some work where that intersected and was looking at why there aren't more women included in cardiology trials, because although women make up half the population of patients with heart disease, they generally make up about 20% of the population in the clinical trials of people with heart disease. And so they're very underrepresented and it is often hard to make definitive statements about how well treatments work in women because there just aren't enough in the clinical trials in cardiology and other medical specialties. But what I am most um, involved with and passionate about now is looking at our use of technology. Um, as a cardiologist, of course, we have a lot of great technologies, but a lot of it um, doesn't get evaluated thoroughly before it gets onto market. And so we have some high risk devices that don't have high quality evidence of benefit before they get approved. And so I look a lot at our regulatory system. How could we do better at both pre-market and post-market approvals? Because in the big picture, we spend a lot of money on healthcare and I try to, my work is oriented towards having spent it on things that you get the most bang for your buck. So where people really get the benefit and where the most people get the benefit, because we have a pretty inequitable system now where some people get a lot of health care and maybe even a lot of health care they would be better off without. And then other people have very limited or no access to health care. Yeah, one thing I've really learned from your work that I wasn't previously aware of is how differently devices are regulated compared to medications. I think a lot of Americans think that the FDA or other bodies like that are very rigorously regulating devices, but, but the answer, based on what you found, is, is that's not always the case. Is that, is that an accurate summary? I think you've summarized it really well, Michael. I mean, when I first started looking at this, and I started actually with um, Sanket Druva, who at that time was a medical student, now is on our faculty back about 15 years ago, but I was already you know, well into my cardiology career and I had no idea that these devices that I was 
using every day in patients had so little and some have absolutely no clinical data before they're allowed to be used in patients. I was quite shocked and I'm quite sure patients would be quite shocked to realize how low the bar is for most devices getting onto the market and then how um, sparse our monitoring is after devices get on the market and are implanted. We don't do very well at following up on devices and, or on tracking um, safety events after approval. Right, and ironically, uh, devices are implanted in the body and it requires a procedure to take it out. So th these are devices are things that are gonna be in you unless you do a procedure. So it's, it's, it is quite concerning that they, they're not studied as well as many of us would think they would be. Exactly. Well, you've also, since I believe it was 2009, been the editor-in-chief of JAMA Internal Medicine, which is one of the top five general medical journals in, in the world. You've published a lot of really interesting pieces under your tenure. My personal favorite is the Less is More series that you have done, um, which aligns with a lot of the Healthy Skeptic MD themes. Could you just tell us before we get into the cholesterol issue uh, a little bit about the Less is More series and what you've been trying to accomplish with that? Sure. I'd love to tell you it's my favorite, I would say, part of the journal, too, because it's very aligned with what I was saying to you earlier, that I think we spend too much um, money and time on things that aren't helping people and then don't have the resources left over for things that really would help patients. Um, although I will say less is more, we don't talk about costs at all. What we look at at less is more is interventions or treatments that have no known benefits because everything we do has some downside, some, some potential for harm. Uh, the way the series got started was back in 2009. So just when I had started as editor, I was talking to um, Deborah Grady, my colleague at UCSF and deputy editor. And it was very... Um, shortly after the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force had just released the mammography guidelines that said that women between the ages of 40 to 49 would have more chance of harm than chance of benefit from mammography. And if you remember, that got very negative reception. The task force was accused of trying to ration health care and trying to do, um, you know, deny women needed life-saving services. And Deborah and I were talking about why was this message that was very clearly based on the evidence that showed very little chance of benefit for in this age group and a lot of harms, mostly from overdiagnosis and false positives going on to more testing that could be very um, risky and certainly provoke a lot of anxiety in these young women. And that was the basis for the recommendation. And we thought, well, I didn't seem like that message of limited or no benefit and a lot of potential for harms was coming through. And that's how we launched the Less is More series. And that is what we focus on in that series is interventions that you would be better off without, essentially. What I think you guys have done well is communicate that nuanced message that more isn't always better. It's, it, it's not always intuitive. And some of the things we do in medicine have harm. And what you've done a really nice job of is is crystallizing and making that concrete, actually the downsides of testing and overuse. Well, our focus today is on um, cholesterol medications and helping our listeners understand the pros and cons, uh, which is, you know, as you mentioned, a, an area of expertise for you as a preventive cardiologist. Well, you know, we've known for years that high cholesterol levels are correlated with heart disease. Um, my first question for you is, does, does high cholesterol, especially LDL bad cholesterol, does it actually cause heart disease or is it just a correlation? Um, I think it's a correlation. You know, there are LDL it itself, I think is a pretty small risk factor for heart disease. You know, there are people that have high LDLs that will never get heart attacks or heart problems and people who have low LDLs and can still have a heart attack. And it, I think is much more a marker than it is sort of something that we should be focusing on most of our energy on. Yeah, and even that's something that was a little different than what I was taught in my training. Uh, the theory at the time was that LDL or cholesterol in the blood actually 
you know, goes into the arteries and leads to plaque formation and causes heart attacks. And maybe that's true, but we're also learning that it's as much um, a marker, as you said, of heart disease as it is necessarily clearly a cause of it. And the reason for that is we have some medications that will lower the LDL or the bad cholesterol, and it, it will not necessarily reduce your risk. Is that, is that correct? You know, statins are very effective in lowering LDL, but the data particularly, and I'm talking about primary prevention. So for people that don't have a history of a heart attack or known heart disease, there isn't any data, um, any clear trials that show a, a benefit on mortality. So you're not any likely to live longer if you take a statin than if you don't take a statin, if you um, don't have heart disease. And the chance of preventing a heart attack by lowering your LDL is estimated at you know one to two people out of a hundred. I think we just uh, published a recent paper that looked at all of the data and said if a hundred people um, took statins for years, it I think it would take two and a half years before one in a hundred would have a reduction in heart attack. And meanwhile, you have a lot of side effects and harms from in that same population and. You know, certainly I think I see a somewhat skewed population because, as I said, a lot of people who want to get off statins come to see me in practice. But I do see a lot of people who have been unable to exercise, are miserable, are tired, feel like they're in a fog. And all of those things have very detrimental effects on your health. I mean, certainly I think exercise is one of the or the most powerful way to keep your heart disease risk low and prevent having a heart attack. And so if you're not able to exercise because you're taking a medicine that's making you so tired or making your muscles weak, it's going to have a lot more harm besides that you feel lousy and people don't like to take medicines, particularly healthy people. And so all of those downsides are much more common than that one out of a hundred person who will avoid a heart attack and that nobody will live longer. And I don't think that we communicate that um, risk and benefit information to patients um, clearly at all, because the the message is kind of know your number, know your number. And I think that this focus on your number is not good for patients. Yeah, I think that's very well said. And I want to come back to a number of those points, both the data and some of the, the unexpected downsides of statin medications. But before we get there, um, just at a basic level, what what causes cholesterol to be elevated? So a lot of it is genetic. You know, your cholesterol level is, is very similar to your parents' cholesterol level. Um, and some of it is lifestyle, too. So there is some component of, you know, what your diet is like and how much you exercise. And I think those are the things that is worth working on, you know, having a heart-healthy diet and getting regular physical exercise. And just because we have a lot of lay audience here today, I'm just going to mention that statins are one of a number of cholesterol-lowering medications. They're the, the, the most probably studied and certainly the most effective in terms of reducing cardiovascular risk, although as we'll talk about, that benefit probably is not as great as many of us would like to believe. So the common medications in this class would be, for example, Lipitor or Atorvastatin. Another common one is Crestor or Rosuvastatin. Let's start with people who have previously had a heart attack or stroke. Um, you know, what, what do we know about these medications in lowering risk of recurrent cardiovascular events in, those, in that population? So in that population, there, are, there is good you know, clinical trial data to show there is a reduction in the risk of an, a second heart attack and a small mortality benefit. Again, that data is stronger in men than in women because a lot of those trials were mostly men. But in general, I think that's a evidence-based recommendation for people that have had a heart attack. As a primary care doctor, I, I do recommend statin medications for people who have, my patients who have previously had a heart attack or stroke. But I always tell them that, you know, in a lot of ways, it's the Band-Aid and, and the, the treatment is the lifestyle changes that, you know, the statin medication may reduce your risk by 20 or 25 percent. But the majority of, of a heart attacks or strokes are actually not going to be prevented from the medication. That's that's still up to you and the lifestyle changes that you make. So so I absolutely do recommend statins in this population. But we have to keep in mind that this is not, it's you know it's a good drug, but it's not a miracle drug. It's not a you know it doesn't cure the problem uh, 
right right away. And and there are also downsides of statins, right? And you started to talk about that before. What are some of the downsides, uh, side effects, and otherwise of statins? And I just wanted to say that it's great that you tell your patients that you know certainly to take the statin if you've had a heart attack to prevent another one, but that it's not a panacea because there is some concern that people think, well, they can take a pill, but they don't have to change their diet. They don't have to, you know, pay attention to getting some physical activity every day. And like you said, that's just not true. You know, you still have to do all of those things if you really want to reduce your risk of a heart attack or another heart attack. Um, the downsides of statins, unfortunately, are not nearly as well studied as they should be for a medication that is, you know, been the number one prescribed drug in the world for over 20 years. We have very little data from randomized trials on uh, statins on adverse events because almost 99% or so of the trials are industry sponsored. I think that there is not very careful collection of adverse events. There's not a lot of focus on it. The data is mostly held by the cholesterol treatment trialists and is not um, publicly available. They don't uh, share the data. And so it's very hard to, to get access and look at the adverse event data. Even the US Preventive Services Task Force statements, which make recommendations on uses of statins don't get access to the individual patient data, so they only are able to access what's already published. So having said that we have very limited data, there, the reports are pretty variable and mostly from observational studies from you know, 10% to 30 to 50% of people that get some kind of side effects with statins, including most commonly, I think, are muscle aches and pains, and that's you know one of the FDA safety warnings. Another FDA safety warning that has been seen in randomized trials, as well as in observational data, is increased risk of diabetes with statins. Another uh, FDA safety warning is on cognitive dysfunction or memory loss. You know, patients feel like they're in a fog, which goes away when they stop their statins. And then there's a lot of other uh, sort of associations that have been reported, you know, GI distress, um, ALS, or lots of other ones that are more um, difficult to really track down because, as I said, we don't have a the kind of big database with longitudinal follow-up that I think we should for a drug that is this commonly used for so many years among so many patients. Yeah, and you got at this before. One of the one of the big ones that I always see most commonly, perhaps because it's most noticeable, is the muscle aches. So very commonly, I'll start somebody on a statin medication, and then suddenly they'll notice some pain in the muscles. And and actually, as you were suggesting to uh, alluding to before, maybe even that that causes them to exercise less, and it, that's going to counterbalance any benefit if you're exercising less uh, because of a statin medication. Is that something you've seen in your practice? Oh, absolutely. Patients who say that, you know, they used to love to exercise, go to the gym, and then they couldn't do it anymore because they were so weak or having so much muscle pain after being started on a statin. And, you know, sometimes they've gone to their doctor and their doctor insisted that the pains weren't from the statin and they should continue on it or switch them to a different statin and they had the same problems. And I have to say, when I stopped the medication, almost every one of them has said, and the, the time course is variable, sometimes they'll get better within a few weeks or sometimes it actually takes months and they're able to return to exercise. So it's very hard not to attribute those side effects to statins, even though there is now a lot of talk about nocebo and whether the, you know people just think they have pains and they can't exercise. But I have to tell you, from the patient's point of view, they're having pains and they can't exercise, and that's what counts. And there was another study uh, in, published in Journal of uh, JAMA Internal Medicine. It was a UCLA study a few years ago looking at the impact of taking a statin on your dietary choice. <laughs> and uh, what, what they seem to find, at least the study seemed to suggest, is that once you were on a statin, you might loosen up a little bit in your uh, your, your dietary behaviors. Um, could you tell us a little bit about, about that observation? Yeah, I think, you know, unfortunately, it's just human nature. As I said, you think if you're taking a statin, you don't have to watch your diet. Maybe you can, you know, have an extra dessert or something else that you know you probably should, would be better off not doing. 
And so what that study did was it tracked people um, over 10 years who started statins over that decade and people who were not on statins and found that the statin users had, a, had higher weight gain and were more likely to become sedentary compared to the non-statin users. Again, suggesting that there was this element that you didn't have to watch your diet or be as active because now you were taking a pill. Right. So for, for folks who have previously had a heart attack or stroke, there's clearly some benefits. They're modest, but they're clearly there in terms of reducing heart and recurrent heart attacks or strokes. But there's also some important side effects to look out for. But let's um, shift now to, to the general population. So for example, somebody who's never previously had a heart attack or stroke, but maybe they're at increased risk because they have high blood pressure or they have a family member who's had a heart, a, a heart attack at an early age, or maybe they have high cholesterol. Um, how do you start thinking about the pros and cons of statin medications in, in someone like that? So for those patients, or for, for those people, they're not patients, they're healthy people. To me, the pros um, and cons are, pr <laughs> there's very little to recommend taking a statin. I mean, I almost never recommend statins for healthy people because it just doesn't, the data doesn't support the benefits. I mean, if somebody really wants to, I'm not, I wouldn't stop them, but I don't recommend that. Because like I said, I think the whole focus on your LDL is really misguided. The focus should be on a healthy lifestyle, on eating fruits and vegetables, you know, eating fresh foods, getting whatever activity you can every day and not smoking. And then, you know, doing other things to try to decrease stress in your life. And I don't, and when people get focused on their LDL and, and, you know, a part of it is because we have had this big campaign on focus on your LDL, but all, patients come to me and they don't want to take a statin and they say, well, can I change my diet to lower my cholesterol? And I'm like, you can change your diet, but we, I don't think we need to measure your cholesterol to know if you have a healthy diet. If you have a healthy diet, that is going to be really good for you and lower your heart disease risk. And we, it doesn't matter whether your cholesterol goes down or not, you should have a healthy diet. And if you have a healthy diet and your cholesterol is high, that's okay. And, you know, if you have an unhealthy diet and your cholesterol is low, that's not so good. I mean, you, you really have to focus on lifestyle and stop focusing on lab values. And, you know, the whole idea of calling high cholesterol a disease, I think is just labeling a lot of healthy people as having a pseudo disease. I don't think high cholesterol is a disease. And as I said, most of it is genetic. Some of it is lifestyle. Uh, but I think the focus really has to be on reducing heart disease by healthy diet and regular physical activity. Yeah, well, I think you said it well. And, you know, so many people want to be able to just take a pill that's going to reduce their risk. And, you know, I can see the appeal for that. But on the one hand, you have this pill that's going to have some pros and cons, and sometimes these side effects are almost as bad as the benefits. And then you have an intervention, um, eating healthier, or exercising more, which will lower your risk without the side effects, and it'll probably make you feel a lot better in, in, in the process. So I always try to explain it to patients that way. Um, I'd much rather see you make the lifestyle changes than, than take a pill. Not that I'm opposed if you really do want to take a pill, but right. I think that's much less important than the lifestyle change. Right. But the problem is most people that want to take a pill have very um, misguided idea about what the pill will do for them. So I just think it's important that we're very honest about what the evidence is because it's much uh, less convincing than one might think by the emphasis on cholesterol that is out there. Right. And that gets at the study that you were mentioning that was published just a few months ago in your journal um, that found that a hundred healthy people, if they took a statin for two and a half years that you prevent uh, one heart attack or stroke. It's not nothing, but there there is something there. Uh, the, the question I guess I would have is, how do you know that you're not going to be that one in a hundred who's going to benefit uh, from the statin? But remember, but none of them live longer, right? There was no mortality benefit. So, you know, you're talking about healthy people. I think when you're talking about healthy people, the only treatments we should be suggesting, you know, pills for healthy people who mostly, most people do not want to take a pill every day. There's nothing fun about taking a pill every day and you only want to do it if it's going to do something for you. And the something for you is generally making you feel better and 
There's nobody who's going to argue statins make you feel better or make you live longer. And even that study didn't find any evidence that statins help you live longer. And so, you know, you could be the one person that the one person that avoids the heart attack, but you're much more likely and you're but you're still not going to live longer. Or you're but you're much more likely to be those 99 people who took a pill every day, didn't live any longer, didn't avoid a heart attack. And maybe 30 or 40 of them were going to have some kind of other, you know, downside, like the fatigue, the muscle aches, the, you know, losing your memory, feeling like you're in a fog. There are just so many other problems. But even if there were no side effects, what is the point of taking a pill every day unless it's going to help you feel better or help you to live longer? Otherwise, I think, you know, just work on lifestyle. Right. And that's about as simple a way as you can uh, put it. Well, you know, it, um, it, it sometimes jokes that um, statin should be put in the water, and I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But there, but there has been uh, discussion about making statins more accessible by, for example, making them over the counter. Um, and I think you've made a good counterpoint against that. Is it fair to say that you would not uh, recommend that statins be over the counter? Well, my concern, you know, is mostly that I already I feel like we're not really tracking statins the way we should, you know, you know, I would love to have better numbers on what the adverse effects are, and we don't track them. I think if they went over the counter, we would have even less um, tracking of them because we don't, we just don't track over the counter medicines as, as well. And then we don't track prescription drugs as well as we could, but even less for over the counter. I mean, otherwise, I think most of the arguments over are over availability, I mean, over uh, pricing and whether they would be, uh, you know, so I, I don't, because I don't see the big advantages to making them more widely available, I don't see the big advantage to making them over the counter unless there are already um, generic statins that are pretty cheap. So that has helped to bring down the price. They're not, you know. Well, let me... Uh, conclude with uh, a question that you may get quite a bit as a cardiologist in your practice. Um, say you're an adult and maybe you're a little bit overweight and you have a family history of heart disease, maybe a little high blood pressure. What would you recommend? What are the top priorities for you to prevent yourself uh, from getting a heart attack or a stroke? Sure. I mean, that's a great question. I think that's what we all want to do is prevent a heart attack or a stroke. Um, and I would, you know, say, first of all, I think, you know, tests don't do it. You know, patients want to, you know, can this test help me prevent a heart attack? But a test doesn't help you prevent a, a heart attack. And you do know your risk factors just from what you were already mentioning, you know. And mostly, I think if you want to prevent a heart attack or a stroke, and I think everyone does, I would work on, you know, eating a Mediterranean style diet, so mostly fresh food, a lot of fruits and vegetables, you know, limiting processed food, things that come out of boxes. I like um, Michael Pollan's advice. He said, eat food, um, not too much, mostly plants. And I think that's good advice, you know, but you should certainly enjoy your food and, you know, it's fine to have desserts in moderation, you know, not all the time, but I think people have to enjoy what they're going to eat because any kind of diet is only going to work if you're going to stick with it, you know, for years and years, not if you're going to go on the perfect diet, but you can't stand it. And so you're going to stop after a few weeks. And the same with physical activity. I think you have to find some kind of activity that you can do and that you enjoy and that's not so hard for you and if, and not smoke. And if you have um, that combination in your lifestyle, I think you're doing all you can. And then, of course, if there are other things like, your, you know, your blood pressure is too high or things like that, you can take medications to lower your blood pressure. But the lifestyle interventions will also help to um, decrease blood pressure. Well, it sounds very similar to the advice that I give uh, my patients. Uh, you know, sometimes people come in asking, what test can I do? Is it a stress test I need? And you know, my answer is always, uh, you know, I, I wish I had a magic bullet or a magic pill to make things better, but it's the simple things. It's exercising more, uh, eating less processed foods, and you don't have to be perfect, but just making a shift towards healthier lifestyles. 
a little bit less stress in your life, meditation, those things can go a lot longer way without the side effects and the downsides of any pill or any uh, tests. So I think it's good advice and, uh, and it's simple advice, which, which is good. Well, Dr. Redberg, thank you so much for joining us today on the Healthy Skeptic MD. Dr. Redberg, again, is a cardiologist at UCSF School of Medicine, editor-in-chief of JAMA Internal Medicine. Thanks for joining us today. If you find it, found today's discussion interesting, please do search and subscribe to the Healthy Skeptic MD, and we'll pick it up again next week. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Dr. Hockman. It was great to talk to you. Thanks for having me.